while some online bullion dealers continue to charge almost $2 over spot for one ounce silver rounds, SD Bullion is selling one ounce silver rounds at only 49 cents over spot on any quantity. Again, that's 999 fine silver for just 49 cents over spot for any quantity. If you haven't joined the over 40,000 precious metals investors by making the switch to SD Bullion, what are you waiting for? You could save hundreds or even thousands of dollars on your next order. SD Bullion, the lowest prices, period. Hey everyone, this is Elijah Johnson with SilverDoctors.com. And back with us today is Alistair McLeod from GoldMoney.com. Alistair, thank you so much for joining us today. It's nice to be with you. Thank you. All right. Now, you recently wrote an article about how Brexit might be being influenced by the current political situation in the UK. Now, Theresa May requested an early election. She got elected, but in the meantime, a lot of things went wrong. Did you want to describe the political situation in the UK right now? Uh, yes, yeah, certainly. Um, uh, Theresa May just managed to get re-elected. Uh, we all expected when uh, her campaign started that she would be re-elected with a larger majority, uh, which would be a mandate to negotiate on behalf of the country uh, for a decent Brexit. Um, it wasn't so, however. Um, the problem, I think, was that Theresa May or the Conservatives decided to uh, produce a manifesto uh, because the other parties had produced a manifesto. This immediately took the focus away from Bre Brexit and allowed people to criticise the Conservatives' economic plans, plans about health care, and so on and so forth. And having taken the focus away from Brexit, at that stage, obviously, people began to rebel, if I can put it that way. And this was a large part of the support that Jeremy Corbyn achieved. He managed to persuade uh, the typical student that um, if, if they voted for him, they would have lower uh, uh, university fees or university fees would be uh, uh, stopped altogether. Uh, so that was obviously an enormous attraction. Uh, but he also managed to get votes from the 30 to 40 year old age bracket who are probably too young to remember the enormous disruption Marxist policies had on day-to-day uh, -day life. And by that, I mean uh, the unionization of nationalized industries uh, such as the railways, uh, such as steel, such as uh, telecoms and postage, uh, water and electricity. Now, of course, uh, these are all uh, in the private sector, though they are heavily regulated. Uh, and uh, consequently, uh, the businesses are a lot more efficient. They work. Uh, we're not held up by and large by strikes, though there have been strikes on a portion of the railways. Uh, and um, people have sort of forgotten this. Older people like me are fully aware of those horrors, and we're also fully aware of what, what went on with proper Marxism in the Soviet Union and China, particularly the Soviet Union when the Berlin Wall came down. Suddenly, we could see that the supposed socialist, um, uh, communist uh, Nirvana, Nirvana is, was actually completely false. So... Uh, I think that Corbyn's timing on this was perhaps fortuitous from the point of view of the uh, lack of memory of the people who voted for him, uh, the blatant um, uh, bribery, if you like, we will pay for your school fees or we, with your not your school fees, but your, your university fees with someone else's money. The myth that uh, more money could be extracted from the capitalist rich and from companies. Uh, and um, as a result, Theresa May lost her majority. She has just um, concluded an agreement with the DUP, which is the Democratic Unionist Party, which uh, returned 10 uh, MPs from Northern Ireland constituencies. Though that, again, is fraught slightly with trouble because, or difficulties because the uh, Sinn Féin, which uh, is the, um, if you like, the Catholic um, and the political uh, arm of the IRA, 
which has been causing so much trouble in Northern Ireland in the past. Um, obviously, I think we've yet to, w to see what their response is to this. Generally, it's not a good idea to get um, the, uh, uh, you know, one side or another of the um, Irish parties involved because there is the risk that the peace agreement might be undone. So that's roughly where we have got to so far on the electoral process. Um, I think that it's true to say that uh, Theresa May uh, got a lot of extremely negative press and the initial comments from the political world suggested that she wouldn't last long. However, we do have the focus, the focus of Brexit, and I suspect that uh, the parliamentary party is certainly rallying behind her, and I think the ministers are rallying behind her as well, because the overriding objective is to negotiate a safe Brexit rather than have political infighting for the leadership. So that's roughly where we are at this moment. I don't know if you could expand a little bit on where you see the Brexit negotiations going from here. Uh, yes, certainly. Uh, the the press on Brexit negotiations has generally been pretty negative, with everybody seeing the difficulties. However, uh, I would contend, and we've seen certainly some evidence to support this contention, that uh, Germany in particular, as the leading uh, country in the EU, particularly after Britain leaves, has an ambition to expand its um, uh, production, its uh, markets into uh, Asia. Um, it cannot do that effectively while Britain is within the EU because Britain basically follows American uh, economic policy or, sorry, geopolitical policy. And consequently, uh, with um, the dislike of Russia from America. I mean, we're basically in America's pocket on this one. And so we more or less repeat what uh, the American intelligence ser services tell us uh, as to how evil and terrible Russia is. Take us out of the EU and Germany will be free to run her own geopolitical strategy. She will move away from uh, the Anglo-Saxon dominance Germany also will lead the creation of a new EU army, which is already uh, well underway in terms of uh, the planning. Uh, and um, I think that uh, generally uh, Germany sees uh, the EU as being uh, the most effective base for her to expand her production into Asia. So she wants us out. And I think that also means uh, that um, she is not going to stand in the way, if you like, of um, Britain getting out with a reasonably good deal as far as Britain is concerned. Furthermore, German manufacturers have substantial investments in the UK, and the UK is a substantial market for them. Throughout Europe, you get uh, component suppliers, for, for example, for the auto industry, with um, uh, manufacturing facilities all around Europe, including the UK. It will not suit big business to have tariffs. Therefore, on that basis, I think quite clearly the pressure on Brussels to, to, to give Britain a tariff-free or a relatively tariff-free deal, I think will be um, uh, impossible for them to resist. Now, you were mentioning about Jeremy Corbyn's campaign in the UK general elections and how he was really inspiring youth to follow socialism, you know, and I, that kind of reminds me about what happened in the United States here with uh, Bernie Sanders being a socialist. And he was really influential here for he really got a lot of the youth over here excited about socialism. And you've recently wrote an article about this and you were saying how basically socialism, modern socialism is communism light. Can you expand on this? Uh, yes, it is. The principle of socialism is quite simple, and that is to move away from capitalism. Uh, and so in that sense, whether it's communism or democratic socialism, which is uh, uh, the description we have, if you like, sort of Christian socialism in Europe, um, it is immaterial. Uh, the, the bogeyman, as far as the left is concerned, is really 
capitalism. Capitalism, however, is, I mean, they, they, they call it capitalism. You and I, I think, I, I hope you would agree with me, would uh, tend to call it free markets. Free markets is basically the freedom for you and I to do things, to transact things together, to buy things, sell things, whatever, without having anyone else interfering in that process. So it's not, um, I mean, you know, free markets are apolitical, uh, but um, Communism was sort of competing, if you go way back to uh, the beginning of the last century, it was really competing with fascism. And fascism uh, is really another form of socialism. The difference between the two is that in communism, uh, the state wants to own the means of production and to distribute the goods that are produced by the state to the people in the proportions and at the uh, and and at prices that the state will set. Now we know that that sort of massive planning just doesn't work. If you look at uh, uh, Christian socialism, if you like, in Europe, it has exactly the same problems. Maybe not to the same degree, but the problems basically are there. When it comes to fascism, fascism uh, allows you to own your, you know, your own business, your own property, but uh, the state directs what you do with it. And usually, in a fascist state, that uh, you know, the government will insist that uh, what you do with your property is actually in support of the state. So that's the two. Those are the two ways in which um, uh, the extremes of socialism actually work. Now, the reason that, uh, that fascism got such a bad name, as it were, uh, and communism didn't, was that in the 1930s, when Hitler started, uh, um, you know, putting pressure on the, on the Jewish community, and you had Kristallnacht and all these horrible things, um, there was a flood of refugees leaving Germany and uh, latterly Austria, and they had tales of absolute horror. So we knew, we knew how bad fascism was before World War II. And indeed, because we knew how bad it was, that's why we went into World War II, because we didn't want it uh, imposed upon ourselves. Communism, on the other hand, was slightly different, because um, uh, Russia uh, very, very cleverly uh, stopped any disin any uh, true information uh, leaking out from the terrible conditions that they put on their people into the West. They fed disinformation into the universities, so professors and um, uh, also uh, students uh, accepted that communism was a way forward. There was, if you like, this sort of idealistic um, belief that communism actually worked. What they didn't see were the uh, tens of millions of people who were deported or killed, or in the case of China, starved um, uh, in the name of the state. That's what communism was. It was at least as bad as fascism. But, you know, it's a question of the PR that you, that you get that drives you in one direction or the other. Um, free markets don't, uh, are not involved with that at all. Free markets are the whipping boy for capitalists, uh, sorry, for, for, for socialists, of course, but uh, they are completely neutral. They are apolitical. They are freedom. And uh, I think that the big mistake, and this is the worrying thing, going back to your point about Jeremy Corbyn, he actually believes in something erroneous though it is. We have the Conservative Party in this country and indeed politicians all around the world who um, you would think are supportive of free markets, but they seem frightened to take on the socialists and deny uh, their, um, their beliefs, to argue that their beliefs are wrong and why they are wrong. And this is something that Margaret Thatcher did very, very effectively. She didn't. She was no, um, uh, you know, sort of. She she was not a person to sit back and and uh, not let someone like Jeremy Corbyn come up with a socialist argument without contradicting it, and that I think is where Theresa May went very wrong in the election. There was absolutely no, um, if you like, no mission, no no belief. Um, no understanding of the free market case. She was unable to argue it. Rather than argue it, she would just back off. And so the whole thing would be left hanging in the air. So Corbyn appeared to be someone, a, a politician with beliefs, whereas Theresa May appeared to be a politician with no beliefs. And that, 
I think, was immensely damaging and a great tactical error. Right. And I was wondering if you could expand a little bit on why socialism or communism light, as you say, really doesn't work. You were writing in your article about how... Uh, I'll just quote from the article here. You said free government money, either obtained by the state from taxation or by borrowing or printing it, has infinite demand. And this is really the principle that makes socialism or communist light not work. Can you expand on that? Yes. I mean, I mean basically, um, the, the, the concepts behind uh, communism and also socialism, as we know it, is to is to take money from the people who are rich and redistribute it to the poor. What uh, is ignored in this, quite simply, is that you are destroying wealth. And the difference between a country which has a high standard of living and one which has a very low standard of living is wealth. It's actually is, uh, not, no more complicated than that. If you destroy the wealth in an economy, then you destroy the economy itself. Uh, and that is the underlying problem that you have um, in it with, with, with socialism. And uh, it, you know, it was so much more apparent with communism. We have the same problem here with, with socialism. When it comes to free prices, one of the big, big costs that we have in this country, and you have it in America too, is, is health care. Health care is an enormous cost, enormous burden. And the reason it is so expensive partly is because government uh, either runs it or regulates it. Uh, I mean, for example, the production of drugs um, is made unnecessarily expensive, uh, and there is no competition between producers. Governments will accept suppliers of one drug uh, and uh, give them effectively a monopoly. Um, so that makes the whole process incredibly expensive. Now, obviously, if you offer any service which is demanded by the public for free, then you're going to get infinite demand. <laughs> it is a simple law of uh, of prices. And uh, so we, we're getting the birth of, worst of both worlds here. We're getting um, the destruction of wealth. And at the same time, uh, we are offering free services, free at the point of use uh, to every individual, which means that the costs become more and more infinite. And that's really what I was referring to when uh, I, you know, I, I mentioned this I think very, it's a very simple point that if you offer something that's demanded for free, demand is effectively in, infinite. Definitely. And did you want to talk a little bit about how you're saying we're seeing the destruction of wealth and then, you know, the infinite demand of wealth. Also, if we move towards more of a communist society now, also coupled with this, we have the financial problems you and I have talked about so much. So where do you see this all heading? Well, um, I, I'm afraid that the costs of government are escalating rapidly. We've known for some time that the future liabilities of pensions and uh, health care and so on and other welfare costs, um, if you if you uh, move them, if, if you try and judge what they are in terms of net present value, you end up with enormously worrying figures. Um, there was an, uh, an analysis done uh, by Mercer's, uh, and this was about three weeks ago, I think, looking at, at the pension costs in just eight countries, eight major economies. And they concluded that the net present value of all these liabilities amounted to some $450 trillion equivalent. This is just incredible. It's one of the uh, side, of, uh, if you like, the consequences of reducing interest rates to um, uh, effectively zero, because if you do that, then the net present value has to be discounted at zero, which means you need an awful lot of capital in order to cover an income stream uh, paid out to pensioners. But it's not just it's not just pensions. Uh, alarming though that figure is. We're not talking about the world. We're just talking about the eighth largest economies. Um, not only is that alarming, but you've also got the healthcare costs, which uh, with people um, in Japan, for example, expected to live to 107. Um, someone born uh, between uh, 2010 and today in America and in Europe is expected to live to over 100. Uh, you know, these these are costs that have to be borne, if you like, in a in, in a socialist uh, welfare distribution system by the existing workforce. This um, this this cannot uh, go on. And uh, so I, you know, whatever the short term problems we have with financial worries, whether it's 
the Italian banking system or whatever it is, um, you know, the long term really does look very, very bleak. And I would see that uh, the West actually is in a situation of pretty well terminal decline, unless um, somehow uh, the politicians can persuade everybody, take their electorates with them in the direction of sound money. Only then, out of personal savings, with people putting aside money for their own retirement and against the contingency of their own ill health, taking that burden away from the state, are we likely to have uh, successful economies in the longer term? But we are so far from there, I just cannot see... <laughs> Any politician daring to tackle it, though obviously the bureaucrats in Treasury departments are becoming acutely aware of these problems uh, uh, arriving in the future. Definitely. And one of the things that we like to do on this channel is really talk about how we can take action. You know, we can you know talk about how we're moving to socialism all day, but if we can't do anything about it, it's, it's not always... Um, the most productive, you know? So what are some ways that we can take action against socialism? Or if you think, I don't know how realistic that is, that we'll actually be able to change the system, how can we protect ourselves so we're not harmed by it? And also, you know, inform our friends and family about it. Well, um, first, first of all, I must say, I never give investment advice because I'm not licensed to do so. And in any event, I don't want to do so. Um, but what I would say is that uh, it, it obviously, if, if you accept what I say about the future bankruptcy of, of, of uh, the welfare state system, then it does make sense not to get caught up in it as much as possible. Uh, and that raises the question as to how you protect your savings. Um, now, we do know that in a weak money uh, uh, economy, um, that property does pretty well, uh, but you've got to be able to ride out the swings, if you like, of debt liquidation. And I suspect that there is one coming up. I mean, we see this bubbling on the surface in places like Canada. Um, we see uh, property prices beginning to stall in certain areas in the UK. Um, in this last year, I've traveled around the Far East and I've noticed how uh, there have been property booms in the major cities there. I mean, I can see that there is, um, if you like, a li likely to be uh, some disruption in property prices, asset prices uh, in the coming months, uh, particularly if the credit bubble begins to, 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 to burst. Um, other than that, uh, I think quite simply uh, what, um, what I do is I think in terms of sound money. And sound money is the money which people, uh, in the absence of governments, select for themselves. And that quite simply is gold and silver. Um, I wouldn't say that gold and silver is an investment. Um, I would say that it might be a speculation, but if you want to speculate, you take your life into your own hands. But it does make sense, I think, to um, have some money uh, in gold, um, possibly silver, poor man's gold, if you like, uh, as, um, as, uh, as an insurance policy, if you like, against the collapse of paper currencies. And I think other than that, it's actually quite difficult to come up with anything a lot more constructive. I mean, obviously, the, the, you know, there will be opportunities and all the rest of it. But I think in terms of paradigm shifts in valuations, the one thing I do expect to see is uh, the price of of gold in paper currencies should rise quite significantly uh, at some stage in the future. It could happen quite suddenly. It might take time to do. That we honestly don't know. Uh, but I think that's probably the best protection that uh, individuals can have against um, what is likely to happen in, uh, over the next year or two. All right. Well, Alistair McLeod, thank you so much for joining us today. Before we let you go, did you want to share with the viewers any last thoughts you had and where they can find you online? Well, um, I think keep well, keep safe, <laughs> look after your health. That's probably a pretty good thing too, actually, as well as uh, maybe having a little bit of gold and silver. Um, you'll find my writing on goldmoney.com um, and I write a weekly article which is released on sort of Thursday, sort of midday-ish, I suppose, uh, Eastern time. Uh, and I write a market report which is released at about the same time on the Friday. So those are the two regular things that, um, that, that, that I write for Gold Money. All right. Once again, Alistair McLeod, thank you so much for joining us today. That's my pleasure, Elijah.
while some online bullion dealers continue to charge almost $2 over spot for one ounce silver rounds, SD Bullion is selling one ounce silver rounds at only 49 cents over spot on any quantity. Again, that's 999 fine silver for just 49 cents over spot for any quantity. If you haven't joined the over 40,000 precious metals investors by making the switch to SD Bullion, what are you waiting for? You could save hundreds or even thousands of dollars on your next order. SD Bullion, the lowest prices, period. Hey everyone, this is Elijah Johnson with SilverDoctors.com. And back with us today is Alistair McLeod from GoldMoney.com. Alistair, thank you so much for joining us today. It's nice to be with you. Thank you. All right. Now, you recently wrote an article about how Brexit might be being influenced by the current political situation in the UK. Now, Theresa May requested an early election. She got elected, but in the meantime, a lot of things went wrong. Did you want to describe the political situation in the UK right now? Uh, yes, yeah, certainly. Um, uh, Theresa May just managed to get re-elected. Uh, we all expected when uh, her campaign started that she would be re-elected with a larger majority, uh, which would be a mandate to negotiate on behalf of the country uh, for a decent Brexit. Um, it wasn't so, however. Um, the problem, I think, was that Theresa May or the Conservatives decided to uh, produce a manifesto, uh, more or less repeat what uh, the American intelligence ser services tell us uh, as to how evil and terrible Russia is. Take us out of the EU and Germany will be free to run her own geopolitical strategy. She will move away from uh, the Anglo-Saxon dominance. Germany also will lead the creation of a new EU army, which is already uh, well underway in terms of uh, the planning. Uh, and um, I think that uh, generally uh, Germany sees uh, the EU as being uh, the most effective base for her to expand her production into Asia. So she wants us out. And I think that also means uh, that um, she is not going to stand in the way, if you like, of um, Britain getting out with a reasonably good deal as far as Britain is concerned. Furthermore, German manufacturers have substantial investments in the UK, and the UK is a substantial market for them. Throughout Europe, you get uh, component suppliers, for, for example, for the auto industry, with um, uh, manufacturing facilities all around Europe, including the UK. It will not suit big business to have tariffs. Therefore, on that basis, I think quite clearly the pressure on Brussels to, to, to give Britain a tariff-free or a relatively tariff-free deal, I think will be um, uh, impossible for them to resist. Now, you were mentioning about Jeremy Corbyn's campaign in the UK general elections and how he was really... ...where we have got to so far on the electoral process. Um, I think that it's true to say that uh, Theresa May... Uh, got a lot of extremely negative press, and the initial comments from the political world suggested that she wouldn't last long. However, we do have the focus, the focus of Brexit, and I suspect that uh, the parliamentary party is certainly rallying behind her, and I think the ministers are rallying behind her as well, because the overriding objective is to negotiate a safe Brexit rather than have political infighting for the leadership. So that's roughly where we are at this moment. I don't know if you could expand a little bit on where you see the Brexit negotiations going from here. Uh, yes, certainly. Uh, the the press on Brexit negotiations has generally been pretty negative, with everybody seeing the difficulties. However, uh, I would contend, and we've seen certainly some evidence to support this contention, that uh, Germany in particular, as the leading uh, country in the EU, particularly after Britain leaves, has an ambition to expand its um, uh, production, its uh, markets into uh, Asia. Um, it cannot do that effectively while Britain is within the EU, because Britain basically follows American uh, economic policy, or sorry, geopolitical policy. And consequently, uh, with um, the 
dislike of Russia from America. I mean, we're basically in America's pocket on this one. And so we, with proper Marxism in the Soviet Union and China, particularly the Soviet Union, when the Berlin Wall came down, suddenly we could see that the supposed socialist, um, uh, communist uh, nirvana, nirvana is, was actually completely false. So uh, I think that Corbyn's timing on this was perhaps fortuitous from the point of view of the uh, lack of memory of the people who voted for him, uh, the blatant um, uh, bribery, if you like, we will pay for your school fees or we, with your, not your school fees, but your, your university fees with someone else's money. The myth that uh, more money could be extracted from the capitalist rich and from companies. Uh, and um, as a result, Theresa May lost her majority. She has just um, concluded an agreement with the DUP, which is the Democratic Unionist Party, which uh, returned 10 uh, MPs from Northern Ireland constituencies. Though that, again, is fraught slightly with trouble because, or difficulties because the uh, Sinn Féin, which uh, is the, um, if you like, the Catholic um, and the political uh, arm of the IRA, which has been causing so much trouble in Northern Ireland in the past. Um, obviously, I think we've yet to, w to see what their response is to this. Generally, it's not a good idea to get um, the, uh, uh, you know, one side or another of the um, Irish parties involved because there is the risk that the peace agreement might be undone. So that's rough uh, because the other parties had produced a manifesto. This immediately took the focus away from Brexit Brexit and allowed people to criticize the Conservatives' economic plans, plans about health care, and so on and so forth. And having taken the focus away from Brexit, at that stage, obviously, people began to rebel, if I can put it that way. And this was a large part of the support that Jeremy Corbyn achieved. He managed to persuade uh, the typical student that um, if, if they voted for him, they would have lower uh, uh, university fees or university fees would be uh, uh, stopped altogether. Uh, so that was obviously an enormous attraction. Uh, but he also managed to get votes from the 30 to 40 year old age bracket, who are probably too young to remember the enormous disruption Marxist policies had on day-to-day uh, -day life. And by that, I mean uh, the unionization of nationalized industries, uh, such as the railways, uh, such as steel, such as uh, telecoms and postage, uh, water and electricity. Now, of course, uh, these are all uh, in the private sector, though they are heavily regulated. Uh, and uh, consequently, uh, the businesses are a lot more efficient. They work. Uh, we're not held up by and large by strikes, though there have been strikes on a portion of the railways. Uh, and um, people had sort of forgotten this. Older people like me are fully aware of those horrors, and we're also fully aware of what, what went on 